John Mark, I'm so excited for this conversation uh, because a key theme in your book. The final one. Yep. Here it comes. Is increasing our intentionality. Yeah. In partnering with God for our own spiritual formation. So ultimately, how do we do that? Yeah. I quote um, Pete Scazzaro, who was, you know, a figure in your life when mm -hmm. you were in New York and has played a, a role in the development of my thinking in so many ways. He has this beautiful line, nurturing a growing spirituality with depth will require a conscious, intentional plan for our spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. and I think that language is really important. It's a plan um, for our spiritual lives. He's not saying we plan our spiritual lives right. because we don't. We're not in control of our spiritual formation. That's one of the first hard lessons you have to learn once you start to take formation or apprenticeship seriously is that it's wildly out of your control. Like mm -hmm. what you can control is you basically set yourself before God every day, all of the time through practices and relationships and dispositions of surrender in the heart. But you can't control your transformation. But that's not to say that we don't make a plan for our spiritual lives. And we basically plan for almost anything that we value, whether that's a relationship or a marriage or a job or a career or a dream to come true. And so, yes, a key part of what I'm calling people to is to bring more intentionality. Planning may sound like a horribly unromantic word, but to bring more decision and intention to their life with God. And uh, how do you propose one would go about such a plan? Ah, I'm thankful you asked, mm -hmm. Tyler Staten. You know, I think one of, we're both, both of us, I think I can speak for both of us, are really interested in the answer to that question that the earliest followers of Jesus came up with to, you know, the end of the first century, what they called a rule of life. Mm -hmm. That's ancient language, not modern language. Yeah, obviously wildly unattractive to modern ears to hear rule of life. That's the destination of this whole thing. What are you talking yeah. about even? Um, it's important to note that the word or the title is rule of life, singular, not rules for life, plural. So a rule of life is not a list of rules. I mean, you may have some do's and don'ts in your rule. But that's not what it is. The original Latin word was this word regula, where we get words like regular, regulation. It's also where we get words like rule or ruler because it literally means a straight piece of wood. Mm -hmm. And there's debate about this from scholars, but many argue that it was likely the word used in the ancient Mediterranean for a trellis in a winery or a vineyard. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever been to a winery, you know that um, grapes don't just grow on the ground wild or up the side of a rock. They put them on a trellis in order to get them up off the ground and to index their growth in the right direction toward life and light and space in order to get the vine to bear the maximum amount of fruit. And without a trellis, a, vein, a vine may just die or not live in the first place, or it may live but kind of just be incredibly vulnerable to disease, damage from getting trampled on, wild animals. And in a similar way, you know, Jesus' word picture for spiritual formation right. that we mentioned in John, John 15, 15. Yeah. Is, a, is abide in the vine, I am the branch, you, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And if you think about his word picture, early Christians kind of took it to its logical conclusion. All right, if he's the vine and we're the branch and the goal is to bear much fruit, then just like a vine, we need a trellis. We need some kind of a support structure to kind of get us going in the right direction, to open us up to the spiritual equivalent of sun and rain and oxygen to protect us from wild animals and getting trampled on. We need some kind of an organizing structure to go underneath our life with God. And that's what a rule of life is. I define it as a schedule and a set of practices and relational rhythms that organize our life around the three goals of a disciple. Be with Jesus, become like him, do as he did. And in doing so, enable us to live in alignment and congruence with the deepest desires of our heart. Yeah, and, and personally, in my own journey with Jesus, I love this. Yes. I love this idea, I love this language, I love this picture, because 
it's it's all about participation with God, right? A the vine doesn't build the trellis. Yes. The gardener does. And in Jesus's word picture, the gardener, the father prunes us that we might be even more, more fruitful. fruitful. And so a rule of life, um, maybe two things that would be helpful is one, that word ruler. We talked at the beginning of this series about aiming our life according to our deepest desires. And a rule of life is a way to live today drawing a straight line between me and my telos, yes. or me and who my who you want to design. become. Yes. And the trellis that would be built in that image is built by the gardener, not by me. And so a rule of life is not my ideas for how I can squeeze the most out of my spiritual life. Rather, it's trying to pay attention to God's invitations to me. It's how we say yes to Jesus. Right, to his work within me and saying, okay, well, then how can I live today inhabiting your invitation so that I can create the most room in my inner With my world? whole body, with my whole life. Right, for your transformation. So I love this. But some people might hear this and say, man, that just sounds like a whole lot of work. Yes. <laughs> so, so what would you say to that person? Well, it is. Life is work. I mean, what I would say is you already have a rule of life, mm -hmm. even if that language is three minutes old in your mental Rolodex, you already have a rule, meaning you already have some kind of a schedule and set of practices and relational rhythms that you live by. The question is not, do you have a rule of life? It's, do you know what it is? Mm -hmm. And is it working for you or against you? Is it based on long-term desires of your heart or instant gratification? Is it based on wisdom or on foolish assumptions? Is it, you know, making you more and more person of love or more and more anxious and angry and bitter and hurt and spiraling and so on and so forth? Is it grounding you deeper in relationships or pulling you away from relational connection? These are the questions we have to ask. We already have a rule. So Jesus is not calling us to do something we're not already doing. He's calling us to do something we're already doing differently mm -hmm. as an apprentice of him to, again, we all have an animating center. We all have some telos is the word you use, some mm -hmm. aim that we are aiming our life at. The apprentice of Jesus is one who's aiming his life or her life at being with Jesus, become like him, doing what he did. But I love what you said about it. it's how we inhabit. It's our yes to Jesus invitations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, often we think that Jesus just wants our heart or our belief system, and the news is so much worse and so much better. He wants all of us. He wants our body, our habits, our budget, our relationship with our phones, our relationships with other people. Like, he's after saving, healing, freeing all of us, which means whatever our apprenticeship to Jesus is, it must incorporate all of us. Not, I mean, the classic idea, Jesus never used the phrase spiritual life. He's not interested in your spiritual life. He's just interested in you, in your life, all of life. Mm -hmm. and, and so before everyone, before they take on a new set of intentional practices, before they understand the nitty gritty of what's in it and what fills it, we understand, well, what's it supposed to do to me? Yeah. Right? I, I don't sign up for like a farm to table dinner delivery program or whatever, like the new blue apron of the world, because I understand every one of the recipes. It's because, oh, this is supposed to give me healthy food that makes me feel good and takes mm -hmm. away the stress of deciding what I want to cook my family for dinner, right? So we understand what it's supposed to do to us. So what is a good rule supposed to do to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it slows you down. So a good rule, especially for a modern person, is freighted to the side. So Dallas Willard and other teachers on formation kind of divide spiritual disciplines or practices into two categories. Uh, Willard called them uh, practices or disciplines of abstinence and disciplines of engagement. Mm -hmm. Another way to say that would just be some are about doing and others are about not doing. So for example, preaching the gospel is a discipline of doing. You go out and do it. Fasting is a great example of not doing. You literally, the discipline is to not eat. Mm -hmm. uh, silence and solitude are the discipline of not talking, not being around people, not being around noise. These aren't things you do. They're more like 
things you don't do, you abstain from for a period of time. And both are important. We need a healthy blend. They, they do similar but opposite things that have deep effects on our soul. So, you know, the basic logic is that let's imagine we have two sets of muscles. One is our, our don't muscle and the other is our do muscle. And if your don't muscle is weak, if you're struggling to say no to sin, whether that's gossip or compulsive shopping or angry comments at your spouse, then you likely need a discipline of not doing to strengthen that muscle. Mm -hmm. If it's the opposite, then you need a discipline of doing to strengthen that muscle. Yeah. So there's like there's an actual psych psychospirituality here where these actually like impact our nervous system and our body and how we're wired. But I think for most modern people, the crying need of the hour are practices and disciplines that slow us down. Mm -hmm. They get us back in our bodies and create time and space for us to open to God so that God can begin to develop the fruit of the Spirit in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, through a joyful just sense of friendship with God and mm -hmm. just a sense of his presence and his peace. So both are important, practices of doing and practices of not doing, but one of the best things a rule of life will do for you is it will just, it will slow you down. It will cap the anxious, driven, frenetic, exhausting busyness and hurry of life in the modern world that is just hollowing out people's soul and hollowing people's out, out people's life with God. Yeah, and, and what I hear you saying is like a farmer cultivating a piece of land, a rule of life begins by taking things out of the soil yeah. so that it can be fruitful before it puts anything in. And so a good rule should definitely, or tip in our culture, I would say a good rule will almost always make you do less, yes. not do more. So it's For not most actually, modern people. Right. It's not actually, oh, this sounds like a lot of work. This sounds like I probably need to declutter my life to make room for God's transformation yes. in me. And you've written an entire book on hurry, you know, but I <laughs> mostly think, because I need to hear it. Yeah, and I think what we're we're also acknowledging is if you look at people throughout history who came most alive to God, who lived with greatest joy, you won't see a lot of hurry. Yeah. You know, they they're slow, they're at peace. A quiet inner life seems to be the canvas on which God paints his masterpieces, mm. right? And and so I, I would say and, and I think it's so important to hear, a rule of life is not another spiritual practice to tack onto your spiritual practice. It's you're a, a already over-busy, exhausting yeah. life. It's a container that fits in and shows you what to throw out yeah. of your formation. So let's talk about what fits in. What are the practices that would fit into a rule of life? Hmm. I think I'm still stuck on what you said a few minutes ago. Okay. And I just want to agree with it. If you've ever had the chance to meet somebody older who is verging on the boundary of sainthood, mm -hmm. just meaning somebody who's really godly, mm -hmm. they are, I have never met one that was like the driven, hyper type A, hyper accomplishment. Not that that's bad, but they are to a T peaceful, unhurried, painfully patient at times. Sometimes yes. I'm like, let's go, all right? Mm -hmm. Joyful. And part of that is because they have attuned their body to Jesus' way of being in the world. And Jesus seemed to, in many ways, be that kind of a person. Mm -hmm. To back up to your question, many of these practices of abstinence, of not doing, thinking here of Sabbath, silence, solitude, simplicity, slowing, these begin to, they are, they are how we say yes in a hurried, busy, digitally distracted, exhausted culture where burnout is a rite of passage for millennials. Um, they are ways that we habituate the pace of love, the pace of Jesus into our bodies. And what practices do, and now we get right to like the crux of what the practices of the spiritual disciplines do, is they are how we do what we can do so that the spirit of Jesus can do within us what we 
cannot do mm. right now by direct effort. So here's how I think about it. There's direct change and indirect change. So let's say you want to make a change in your life. There's an area where you know that you are not like Jesus and mm -hmm. you genuinely want to change. If it's a small area that was within the realm of your willpower, meaning the kind of the range of your effective willpower, then you just approach it directly. Like you might decide, I cuss a lot and I want to cuss less. And that might be within the realm of your willpower. I can just decide to stop cussing. Yeah, and I might occasionally slip, yeah. but then I catch myself and, and I'm like, oh, so, yeah. eventually I you kind of get I it. I don't do it anymore. And yeah. willpower is a great way where you just, you kind of, you read some of what the New Testament says about speech. Mm -hmm. And you look at the speech of Jesus and you realize, oh, you know, my mouth does not <laughs> sound like what comes out of Jesus' mouth. And mm -hmm. what Paul and Peter seem to think should come out of the mouth of a disciple of Jesus. So that is the type of change that not all people, but many people can approach that directly. But then whenever we deal with significant change, um, willpower is just utterly powerless against it. So like some of the deepest changes, you know, you and I were chatting just the other night at dinner about yeah. how we're not the kind of husbands that either of us wanna be. And there are words of unkindness or even disdain that at times come out of our mouths toward our wives that are wildly at odds with the heart of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the problem there is not a lack of willpower. Like, I do not want to be that kind of a person. I deeply desire to be a loving husband. And there are times when I really am not. Mm -hmm. And I can't just go flip a switch and just from now on never be unkind to my wife. That's right. far beyond the range of my willpower. Another one example for me would be anxiety. Like, Jesus commands me, do not worry. I deeply desire to obey that command. I would love yeah. to never worry again in my life but I can't just flip a switch. It's wildly beyond my willpower. So the practices, we can't do that. I can't just flip a switch and not worry or never be unkind. But what I can do is I can practice Sabbath. Yeah. That is within the range. I can, once a week, I can put away my devices. I can sit around a table. I can light some candles. I can invite the Holy Spirit and I can set aside a day to stop and rest and delight and worship. And I can open my body and my nervous system up to God. And Sabbath is an embodied way of practicing trust in God. Mm -hmm. You're letting God run the universe while you're not on email and you're not doing your things and you're not running around. And the universe seems to do just fine. Most Sabbaths without me. Mm -hmm. It's also a time when I get to be with my wife in a different way, you know, in an unhurried way without the pressure of work and email and life and errands and getting people to practice and school, just a day with no to-do list. Like I'm a different person on that day. And I, not always, but tend to have greater capacity to be kind and patient and loving <laughs> and listen. So I can't flip a switch and obey some of these commands of Jesus, but I can practice Sabbath. I can give some of my resources away. I can begin my morning in silent prayer. I can read scripture every day. These are things within the realm of my willpower that en enable me to bring intentionality to my spiritual formation, but indirectly. Mm -hmm. Because again, I can't control my transformation. I can, I can just do my best to open my life to God. And that, you know, um, Jacques Philippe, a French writer I love on the spiritual life, said that the primary task of a disciple of Jesus is just learning how to open deeper and deeper parts of ourselves to grace. Mm -hmm. And that's what the practices do. They're not an end of themselves. I'm no better of a person if I practice Sabbath or not, but it can open me to grace and grace can change me into the kind of person who over many years from now is increasingly more and more loving and less and less worried. Yeah, and, and you and I have collaborated on a rule of life yeah. over a long period of time where we let each other's strengths and weaknesses and quirks and everything influence one another. And Yeah, and people listening may not know that. You and I for quite a while with some other people have been living by yeah. approximately the same rule of life. We each flesh it out in our own way, but... Yeah, and we 
shared that, you, you made it available in the back of your book. And so people can look there for a place to start. But what advice would you give someone that's saying, great, I want to get started. I want to get intentional about my spiritual formation in the way of Jesus. G- give some pointers as someone oh, begins. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of things I would say. One, start small. So um, Margaret Gunther uh, has that great phrase, first week of Lent syndrome. Mm -hmm. for like that feeling when it's like the new year's resolution like i'm gonna change everything about my life right now and i'm gonna do sabbath and contemplative prayer and fast three days a week and then you just crash and burn and Mm -hmm. give up you know so start very small tiny habits micro habits embrace spiritual poverty and humility and just start really really small to begin to both take out and add in practices that augment the trajectory of your life two Focus on subtraction over addition. So take out of your life more than you put in if you are like 99.9% of the people I know. Don't make this about doing more. Make it about doing less. Don't make it about speeding up your life. Make it about slowing your life down. Three, I would say really in the beginning, key in on practices that are deeply joyful for you. Mm. Like it's joy that leads the human heart. There is um, our mutual friend, A.J. Sherrill, who's an Anglican vicar, writes about upstream disciplines and downstream disciplines, and I love Mm -hmm. that kind of. And what he means by downstream disciplines are the practices or spiritual disciplines that are just are easy. We love them. They're, it's just like going with the flow. This is what I would almost do on vacation for fun. Right. I just I love this way of being with God. I love this way of being community in community with God's people. Upstream disciplines are the practices or disciplines that are like hard and slow going and not very fun. And it's like an act of surrender and obe- you know obedience. And we need both. Okay, so we really need both. But I think, and I may be wrong, but as a general rule, we need way more downstream practices than upstream practices. Mm -hmm. We need a few, because often life gives us like the involuntary (laughs) upstream practices. Sure. With circumstances outside of our control, relationships that are difficult for us, and we don't choose them, we just choose what we have not chosen. And that is an essential part of the spiritual life. So I think for people beginning, just ask yourself like a quasi hedonistic question, but in a good Christian way, where do I deeply enjoy God? And it might be a classical spiritual discipline like Lectio Divina or reading scripture, or it might be like, I just love hiking. Like I love on Saturday morning going with my best friend on a long hike. And just, I just feel God, I feel, I breathe, I come alive. I chatted to a guy yesterday that I'd not seen in a while. Kind of an urban, like, cool dude. He's like, how are you doing? He said, oh, I'm doing so much better. And I said, why? And he said, I, I just took up fly fishing. And I was like a little shocked at first. He did not look like, a, I have a stereotype mm-hmm. in my mind of a fly fisherman. And he just said, I, I can be at this high mountain lake an hour and 40 minutes from the city. He's like, I go up every day off. I'm there for seven hours. I sit on the lake. I'm in the choir. I just love it. It's like I'm coming alive again. Mm. And so he had just found, that's not going to be, fly fishing is not on, it's not in my book as a list of the practices of Jesus. Yeah. But yet this act for him had become a way of setting his body before God. And so I think follow your joy, you know, yes, do the hard things. Yes, fast and, you know, do these things that are hard, serve. But I think there's really something to be said for in the beginning, following the the joy of your heart. Let joy lead you. Yeah, and if I could just offer a couple of things, I think different personality types as it relates to a rule can probably be split into two groups of of instant reactions one would be some people immediately become aspirational about a rule of life um and, and i would just want to remind people a rule of life should not be aspirational this is not a workout program that's going to get you to your goals in 3 months or this is not that kind of thing i'm really helped by the image of an anchor yeah. Where, where a ship drops anchor to stay in a certain place. And the, that's because the, the currents of the ocean are drifting, right? Cause the boat to drift. And so 
when you're over top of the anchor, you don't even feel it. Yeah. So that that's the way we should live most of the time. Where it's I don't feel this rule of life. I'm not bumping up against it. This it's, is just how I it's live. It's not straining me. Yep. But then, of course, we feel the tug of the anchor if you're on that boat when you've been drifting but haven't realized it, and suddenly you're going, oh, we've we've drifted away. So that's when you should feel a rule of life, when you're drifting. Mm. But when you're remaining above it, it shouldn't be strenuous. Yes. Um, and then to those on the other side, some people, I think, can just be turned off by the planning and intentionality of this because they romanticize spontaneity and I would just say every relationship of substance is built on rhythm and spontaneity. Yes. Both you know, and. marriage, friendship, everything. You, your best friend from college that you stay in touch with. You have some rhythm of like, oh, yeah, we chat on the phone every other Friday. And then you have spontaneity. And every year we visit a new city together and we have a weekend. And, and you need both of those things to maintain the relationship. If you took either one of them out, the relationship would lose a lot of the substance. And in the same way, if you rely only on spontaneity to know and grow in relationship with God, the relationship will have a, a low ceiling on it. And if you rely only on rhythm, the relationship will have a low ceiling on it. But spontaneity often comes from those who prioritize rhythm. Mm. So if you want spontaneity, I would say a rule of life is a great way yes. to increase the frequency of those memorable experiences with God. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes the practices, especially the ones that make space, are creating space for spontaneity, for mm -hmm. something to happen with God that you did not plan, you can't control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. Your marriage analogy is perfect because it's a relational theory of spiritual formation. So like I, and your anchor analogy, I think of, you know, a key practice in my wife and I's relationship is a, a weekly date night. Mm -hmm. It's not a legalistic rule. I don't think I'm a bad husband or she's a bad wife if I'm out of town or we're too busy or we're exhausted some week and we miss it or we don't have money in the budget that month to go, whatever. But when we're just living our life, every Wednesday night, we share a meal together. And if budgets run low that month, we just go on a walk and watch the sunset together at this park up from our house that we love that overlooks the ocean. And when we miss that, I don't feel guilt or shame, but if I miss it for a week or two or three, I immediately start to notice tension in our marriage, hmm. distance in our marriage, we're bickering more often, we're not on the same page together, and then it's like my boat has drifted from the anchor. I realize, oh wow, um, we need this practice to make space for us to have a loving relationship. And I think something like that is what a rule of life is to our life with God. Hmm. Tyler, thanks so much for having these conversations over the last few episodes. I love you dearly. I respect you so much. And I'm so grateful to live by a rule with you, to be your friend. Let's do it for a, lot, a long time. Yes, all that is mutual, man. This has been fun. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Season 1 of the Practicing the Way podcast. This conversation was based on John Mark's newest book, Practicing the Way, Be With Jesus, Become Like Jesus, Do As He Did, which is available now wherever books are sold. This podcast was created by Practicing the Way, a nonprofit working to integrate the best learnings of spiritual formation into the church at large. We offer a library of free resources for churches and small groups, including practices, four-week experiences designed to be run in community that train you to integrate ancient disciplines like Sabbath, prayer, and more into your everyday life with God, an upcoming Practicing the Way course, an eight-week primer on apprenticeship to Jesus, a digital tool called the Rule of Life Builder, podcasts, and more. We are a crowdfunded nonprofit, and all of these resources are completely free, thanks to the generosity of The Circle and other givers from around the world. To join The Circle, run a practice, or learn more, visit practicingtheway.org.